Good evening, everyone. I am Congressman Jared Huffman. I want to thank everyone who is tuning in or logging on to join me for this virtual uh, shelter-in-place town hall. And uh, thank you in advance for being part of uh, the workarounds that all of us are doing to try to stay in touch uh, as we try to deal with this pandemic. This town hall is focused on the northern part of my district, uh, a place I love and, and really cannot wait to visit when this public health emergency is over. But I'm coming to you right now from San Rafael uh, in the southern end of my district, and uh, that's being made possible by the Community Media Center of Marin, uh, also known as Marin TV. The team here at the Marin TV studios uh, has just really been doing a great job of keeping the lights on to provide public information, which is really an essential thing uh, during this crisis, and, and even when we're not in a crisis mode as well. So I want to thank them for their uh, service to this community and for safely working with me and my team. Uh, thanks also to the partners who are making this broadcast available tonight. Humboldt Access, of course, is broadcasting this live on Channel 10, on Suddenlink Channel 10 up in Humboldt County. And uh, you can stream online at uh, YouTube forward slash user forward slash access Humboldt forward slash live. You can also listen to this broadcast on the radio at KZZH, that's uh, 96.7 FM. And I believe KSRO in Sonoma County is also uh, covering this town hall tonight. Uh, we will be broadcast as well on Marin TV, the education channel. So down here in Marin County, uh, that will be channel 30 on Comcast and on AT&T, that's channel 99. Um, thank you for all of my partners and making sure as many people as possible are able to join us for this community event. I have some excellent panelists that are uh, joining me virtually tonight. I will introduce them in a moment. But let me begin uh, first just by uh, wishing everyone the best, hoping everyone is staying safe and staying home so that we can limit the spread of this COVID-19 virus. Uh, like everyone else, uh, I am trying to adapt my work routines to this shelter-in-place reality. And that means using lots of different tools to try to stay in touch, to try to stay accessible to my constituents. Tonight, we're going to use a combination of technologies. Some of you are going to tune in uh, by radio. Others are probably watching right now on Facebook Live. Or again, some are watching on regular old TV through Access Humboldt or through Marin Channel 30. Uh, I will post the archive for this town hall on my website as well. That's huffman.gov um, for those who want to, huffman.house.gov, sorry, for those who may want to stream it later. And uh, while I, I did say that the focus and, and my panelists are going to be oriented toward the northern end of my district, Humboldt, Trinity, and Del Norte counties, uh, the content we're going to cover tonight is likely uh, applicable and of interest to people throughout my district. And so I really am glad that we're also going to have uh, coverage through our community partners uh, here in Marin and in Sonoma County and in Mendocino County as well. A uh, little bit about the logistics before I introduce the panelists, um, how this program will go. Uh, if you would like to ask me a question, please go to Facebook uh, and you can find my page uh, by going to facebook.com forward slash rep Huffman. Uh, you can see it on the uh, placard right behind me, uh, rep Huffman. And you can go ahead and type in your question. My district director, Jenny Calloway, is seated 10 feet away from me. We are doing responsible social distancing, and she'll be shouting out the questions that you submit um, as they come in a little bit later on. We've already collected some questions in advance, and so we will get started by diving into them first. But we will move to as many questions as possible over the course of our little over an hour together. Uh, and I may take the moderator's privilege to ask some questions of our panelists as well. If we do not get to your question tonight, uh, that won't be the last chance to have a conversation about whatever's on your mind. You can join me at any of my weekly Facebook Live office hours. Uh, we're doing those every Wednesday at noon. Again, if you go to my Rep Huffman Facebook page, uh, we'll be there Wednesday at noon 
to continue this conversation. So let's get to the panelists. I am really fortunate tonight to be joined by Humboldt County's Public Health Officer, Dr. Teresa or Terry Frankovich. Uh, I'm joined by Leela Roberts, who is the director of the North Coast Small Business Development Center, and also Greg Foster, who is executive director of Redwood Region Economic Development Commission. Leela and Greg are going to be great resources. On any questions about uh, small businesses and the benefits that have been made available through the SBA. Uh, and of course, Terry is here to talk about the public a uh, health aspects uh, of this challenge. Now, I know uh, how difficult this crisis is for everyone I represent. In fact, uh, I should be more specific. We're really dealing with two crises, crises that are happening simultaneously, a public health emergency and then the economic collapse that it has forced upon us. And we have to fight both of these crises at the same time. On the public health side, uh, I hope everyone is staying home. We really have to do everything we can to slow the spread of this virus so that we don't overwhelm our hospitals and medical providers and the healthcare system that we all count on. And that means shelter in place, uh, don't go out unless you absolutely have to, and hopefully everyone has figured out by now, if you do go out, wear some kind of a mask or a face covering. Now, this is a buff that I wear when I'm fishing sometimes, but uh, I've repurposed it to be my going out mask when I need to be away from home. Anything that you have that's a cloth covering will help you uh, avoid inadvertently sharing virus with others. So please do all of that. On the uh, economic side of this crisis, the federal government has to step up to uh, recognize the fact that families and businesses, local governments, the state government, and states around this country are reeling from uh, a massive economic collapse. Right now, uh, that involves a lot of triage, uh, providing federal resources to help people get through the weeks and months ahead. But it also needs to include a longer-term perspective. Uh, we are going to need to revive this economy uh, down the road when we get this pandemic under control. And I am actively working on an infrastructure package that I believe has to be part of that national response. Now, Congress has already taken some big steps, so I want to make sure you know that right out the gates when this crisis became known to us, we passed an $8.3 billion supplemental funding measure, bipartisan support, and that provided uh, billions of dollars for treatments and vaccine research. We need to make sure that that vaccine is not only developed, but it's available and affordable to absolutely everyone. Uh, that measure we passed protects against price gouging of medicines developed with taxpayer dollars. It also provides $2.2 billion in prevention, preparedness, and response measures. That included uh, nearly a billion dollars to help state, local, tribal, and territorial health systems deal with the surge that we knew was coming. There was a second action that Congress then took um, within a couple of weeks after that. It was the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and what this was about was providing uh, families health security by making sure that testing uh, for the coronavirus would be free to anyone who needs it, regardless of whether you have health insurance, regardless of your documentation status. Uh, we expanded support for Medicaid. Uh, we included economic security in the form of something really rather unprecedented, two weeks of paid family leave and uh, three months of, uh, paid, two weeks of paid sick leave, three months of family and medical leave uh, for workers who don't have those benefits. Uh, also, some additional support for small businesses by reimbursing them for the leave they provide their employees. And then also some shoring up of our uh, food safety net, nutrition assistance to uh, strengthen SNAP, student meals, senior meals, and food banks. So that was the second thing. And then a really big one. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the third wave of legislation is called the CARES Act. This is a $2 trillion piece of legislation that includes all sorts of new federal resources, direct financial assistance to taxpayers up to $1,200 per person, $500 per child 17 and younger, uh, expanding unemployment compensation pretty dramatically, uh, deferring student loan payments for all federally backed student loans, and uh, waiving 
the tax on seniors who elect not to take the required minimum distribution to their retirement accounts this year, so providing them some financial flexibility. Protection against uh, evictions for renters and foreclosures for homeowners, as long as there's a federally backed mortgage, which often there is, uh, either uh, in your home or in the property that you may be renting from. And uh, a measure to include COVID-19 testing is covered by every single insurance plan in this country without any cost sharing. Billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of relief for small businesses, nonprofits, uh, tribes, uh, and others through a new program called the Paycheck Protection Program that's administered uh, by the Small Business Administration and more. We'll talk uh, in greater detail about some of these programs. And I just want to say that even though we have done a lot uh, already at the national level, I'm not at all satisfied uh, with our national response to this crisis. I've been calling on the president to make more full use of the Defense Production Act so that we can step up production of uh, testing. We are woefully behind where we need to be on testing. Uh, but we also need more medical supplies. You hear a lot about ventilators, but it's more than that. It's masks, it's gloves, it's gowns. And we need to do all of that. The Defense Production Act can help us do more and help us do it faster. And I'm going to continue pushing on that front. I'm calling on the Treasury Department and the Small Business Administration and other federal agencies to do a better job of getting the resources Congress has provided out the door faster to the people who need it most. This program is not yet working the way Congress intended. And it's uh, unacceptable also that the IRS is now saying that if you don't have direct deposit uh, with them for your tax returns, that it may take 20 weeks or more to get those direct individual assistance checks. We've got to do better than that, and I intend to keep pushing. Finally, I'm calling on my colleagues in Congress to do more. Uh, and to do it quickly to provide more support for hospitals, states, local governments, employers and families across this country. And in order to do that, I happen to believe we need to get back on the field. Congress has been on an extended recess uh, for the last going on a month. And while we're working hard, we're trying all the workarounds on conference calls and uh, Zoom meetings and things like that, uh, it's not the same. We need the full House of Representatives, and I believe the Senate, uh, on the field at full speed. And I think a combination of bringing some of us back to the Capitol with proper distancing and also using some technological tools can allow us to do that safely uh, while also fulfilling uh, our constitutional responsibility. So I'll be pushing on all of that. Uh, and with that, I want to get to your questions. And uh, so we are joined, as I said, by these great panelists. And we're going to start with the questions that we have received in advance. I will be turning to, uh, to my district director, Jenny, to ask those questions. But before I dive into that, let me just remind everyone that there's a whole bunch of resources uh, on my website at uh, huffman.house.gov. Uh, you can find my district office phone numbers there as well. And we want you to be in touch. We want to be a resource for you. Uh, on all of these matters that we'll be discussing tonight. So Jenny, why don't you go ahead and fire our first question and, and we'll dive in. Okay, I just wanted to let you know that there was a little technical glitch, so Facebook Live started a little bit late. So some people might have missed your opening. But Gosh, yes, your first I question, won't do it all over again. <laughs> no. Your first question is from Dennis. With all the protocol around COVID-19 in hospitals, elective surgeries have been all but canceled. This impacts rural hospitals severely as elective surgeries cover a significant amount of hospital overhead and margin. What is the federal response to keep our local hospitals whole? As we all know, Medicare reimbursements provide only a fraction of the hospital's cost of health care of delivery. There are some of the un these are some of the unintended consequences of the crisis that aren't so readily visible, like a restaurant or at a bar or a hotel, but everyone needs the help. Yeah, great question, Dennis. So I have been in touch with several of my hospitals, and all of them are feeling the pinch um, from the elected, elective surgeries that they've have, had to put off, uh, from the bed space that they've had to leave open uh, in anticipation of a surge from these uh, COVID-19 cases, uh, and they're hurting. So um, what I can tell you is that Congress uh, has already made, um, I think, a, a serious commitment to backfilling our hospitals, as well as uh, clinics and other 
providers, but it'll have to be more. Uh, and I do understand that, and we want to make sure that uh, the next wave of legislation includes the money to, to keep the lights on. Uh, one other thing I'll mention that we have done, uh, Medicare often does not adequately uh, reimburse hospitals, and there's often um, waiting periods and bureaucracy involved. We have, uh, first of all, increased Medicare uh, compensation for all medical providers during this crisis. Uh, we have also allowed hospitals to draw advance reimbursement payments from the federal government for the Medicare patients that they serve. And so I hope that also helps to, uh, to manage the cash flow crunch, and, and we're going to do more. So appreciate that question. Okay, the next question comes from Ken Wiederman. Why are we not doing mass testing for COVID, and why aren't we doing tier testing to know who has the antibodies, and what is the plan for this virus as it may mutate? Great. Well, I'm definitely going to call upon uh, Terry Frankovich, the public health officer of Humboldt County, to speak to this. But uh, let, let me just add my piece up front. Um, we are so far behind where we should have been by this point in the crisis when it comes to ubiquitous rapid testing. Uh, the whole premise of shelter in place was that it would stop the spread, it would flatten this, this uh, curve, this viral curve, and that would um, not only prevent our healthcare system from being overwhelmed, but it would buy us time to roll out this ubiquitous rapid testing which would help us manage future outbreaks. Um, all of these weeks into the crisis, we're still not there. We're still rationing testing. I've got cases uh, in different parts of my district where we've seen outbreaks in nursing homes, for example. Now that's a place you would obviously want to be able to test every staffer, and if there's an outbreak, every single patient, and they can't do it because there aren't enough swabs, there's not enough reagent, there's not other aspects of the testing, uh, and these vaunted rapid tests that we're hearing about from Abbott uh, and other companies are just not yet available. Uh, so, um, Governor Newsom, I think, has grown very frustrated with waiting for a national uh, testing strategy and response, and he announced a few days ago that California would be undertaking its own initiative and that he would be dramatically increasing our ability to do all these things by the end of this month. That's a good thing. Uh, in a perfect world, we would have had leadership from the federal government that had brought us much further down the road on testing by this point. It hasn't happened. And you're still not seeing, as I mentioned, the Defense Production Act invoked to help solve this testing problem. But the state is stepping up. I know that my local health providers are uh, stepping up in every way they can. Many of my counties have gone direct to Abbott and other testing companies to procure um, this capacity. But l let me hand it over to uh, Terry Frankovich to give us some more perspective from the the medical uh, perspective. Hi, thank you, Congressman. So um, testing has been an, an issue all the way along, as you know, and um, from our standpoint, a couple of things I do want to remind people about is that, you know, public health and labs in general are not built to be high throughput labs. Um, that typically has been the province of large commercial labs, which are set up to run thousands of specimens. So that being said, um, our public health lab, I think, has done an amazing job um, of testing individuals. And in fact, when you combine our local lab as well as the commercial labs, we've tested over 1,400 people now in Humboldt County, which is not what I would like, yeah. um, but certainly better than many areas have been able to manage based on resources. So I think that, um, again, to the question of mass testing, we would love to be able to do broad surveillance testing, but frankly, in order to do that, we would likely need outside resources. Um, we're talking, you know, state or federal mobile yeah. test units, that type of thing that would allow us to do that. In the meantime, we've been working on building our internal capacity. Um, and as you are aware from our discussions, we are um, we do have some equipment in place that we could use to increase some productivity and, and the access to reagents is, is an obstacle, pure and simple. Yeah. And so we, we get in every line, every queue that we can to procure things um, and uh, we get some um, things coming down. We've had some success recently with um, uh, looking like we can access some additional things for a piece of equipment in our lab that would augment our um, efforts. 
but again, it's really supply driven. And uh, so, you know, I can only tell people that as we access increasing reagents and different test modalities that we can use, we are ramping up our internal capacity as much as we can. Um, point of care testing um, is something that is um, available potentially in our community in terms of the equipment to do the test. But again, the reagents are the limiting factor. Yeah. And so we're, we're working with both the state and directly with the companies that produce these reagents to be able to help support point of care testing in hospitals, for instance. Well, it's a work in progress. And you're doing a great job, Dr. Terry Frankovich. Um, I should give you a shout out as well for joining me earlier this week on a, uh, a phone conference of all of my public health directors in all six counties that I represent. Uh, it was a great chance for them, I think, to, to collaborate. And we were able on that call to identify the fact that the same component um, that Dr. Frankovich needs in Humboldt County is needed uh, and is a bottleneck in Sonoma County as well. So we've been making some calls to try to find a way to get you more of that so you can ramp up more testing. I, I don't know that we've had that breakthrough yet, uh, Dr. Frankovich, but uh, we're, we're committed to, to doing what we can to help you. Thank you. Thanks for that. And to the other question that was asked about um, antibody testing, yeah. uh, it's a really good question. It's a really important piece of information we need to develop um, across the state and the country. Um, right now, there really is one um, antibody test that's FDA licensed, approved basically for use. Um, and there are a lot of, I just want to make people aware, there are a lot of entities that are billing themselves as having um, the ability to provide that testing, especially things like home testing and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of things, which um, it, it's really important people understand these things need to be vetted. Um, there are a lot of people, I think, who are aiming to make some money out of the situation and don't necessarily have high quality or reliable tests, which is really problematic. So just be aware that we are we are watching this as well as the state. And as things become available, we have every intention of pursuing that ability to access that testing for area residents. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next question. OK. So the next question is from Robert A., who is writing to find out uh, what website he could use for details about immediate relief for small business owners to receive the federal lo role loan and to keep the employees working. So Robert, thanks. Uh, we want to get these tools for small businesses out to as many people as possible. A couple of suggestions for you. Uh, there is a resource section on my website. If you want to go to um, huffman.house.gov, uh, you will see it under the Coronavirus Resource Kit. And it includes uh, some links and some, some resources relative to small businesses. But the SBA website is terrific. And if you go there, you are going to see all of the frequently asked questions. Um, you're going to see a very helpful tool where you can enter your zip code. And it will tell you instantly all of the different lenders, community banks, credit unions, big banks, everyone in your area who is participating in the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, so check that out and then, um, you know, try, try to get into the program with one of those lenders. We'll, I'm sure, have some more questions and have a chance to talk to Layla and Greg about some of our frustrations at getting that money through these lenders out the door to small businesses. But the resources are there. Between those two websites I just shared with you, you should at least um, be in a good starting place to, to get connected. Okay. Next. Sherm Frederick wants to know, can you please address the mask controversy? How is it that for a month, public health officials told us we didn't need to wear a mask and now it's mandatory? What gives? Well, I'd better go back to Dr. Frankovich on this because I, I myself uh, was kind of surprised that initially uh, it seemed to me like wearing something like this would be a good idea. It would prevent you, since we, we always heard about the droplets causing uh, the spread of this virus. What a great way to prevent you from coughing uh, or sneezing or breathing droplets into the air. But it was pretty late that we received this additional guidance that we should all be doing that. Dr. Frankovich, do you have anything to, to explain why it took them so long to figure this out? Sure. Um, so I, it, it's a, certainly a reasonable question because you're right. We were as a public health community nationally at the state and local levels, you know, we have been following the guidance suggesting um, that while masking and, and 
personal protective equipment was important among our healthcare workers and such, we were not advocating general masking for the public. Um, I think what's important for people to remember is that, you know, this, the knowledge base on COVID has just been evolving fairly rapidly. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, this started with the case, um, the first reported case in China on New Year's Eve, I believe. So in a few months, we've come a very long way in our understanding of this, and there's still a lot more to learn. Yeah. I think, you know, the idea of the public masking is, again, not to protect the wearer. And I think that that was, you know, one issue early on is we felt that, you know, from a personal protection standpoint, this may not be the best tool. And also, of course, there was concern about drawing the masking um, availability away from healthcare workforce, et cetera. But I think what we're learning about this is that that idea of my mask protects you and your mask protects me and the decreasing that asymptomatic shedding, which is a really relatively new understanding about this virus in terms of having some really good data about it, um, that is the rationale for making this change, is really just to decrease the amount of virus that is sort of out there and circulating mm -hmm. in these public spaces based on primarily asymptomatic shedders because everyone else should be at home. Yeah, there, there was a lot of initial confusion originally around the N95 mask, which is the more protective uh, respirator that prevents the viral particles from coming in to you, um, and the, the lesser masks that prevent your virus from being spread to others. And, and that too was, I think, causing the confusion. But we began learning uh, pretty early on that Asian countries, and I don't know if this is by way of public health directives that they impose or whether it is cultural, but you see a lot more masks when a flu or, or something like this breaks out in many Asian countries and their curves were flattening faster than ours. So uh, Dr. Frankovich, was that uh, part of what contributed to uh, the CDC's conclusion, you think? Well, yes, I mean, obviously um, in, in the public health realm, you know, we're watching these examples as everyone is from other countries and what seems to be successful um, how, how much of any country's success can we pin on things like widespread testing versus things like universal masking and um, how do you separate the, out those effects? I think in the end, the bottom line we come to is there may be some benefit and there seems to be when we look at some other countries and that being the case, it's reasonable to adopt as another strategy in our arsenal yeah. for, um, to, for doing this. And I do want to mention again that I, I've been trying to emphasize the idea of facial coverings as opposed to masking. Yeah. So, you know, that concept that a scarf, a bandana, um, you know, those kinds of things can also serve as this barrier um, so that the ability to purchase a mask or to make one yourself doesn't have to be a barrier to, uh, to abiding by this recommendation, which again is a recommendation here. It is not an order at this time. Yeah, very good. Next question. Okay, um, Minnie Wolf from Eureka is asking, what is your opinion about reopening the economy in some parts of the district? We in Humboldt have a low infection rate and haven't had a new case in six days, so why have we not reopened? Very understandable question. All of us want to get everything back to as much normal as, as possible, as soon as possible. I, I would say two things. One, we are not where we need to be yet in terms of maintaining uh, a, a zero spread profile, and I'll invite Dr. Frankovich to speak uh, to this as well. But you, you not only want to uh, bring the numbers down, you want to get to the point where it's not spreading. Uh, and the last few days look very good in Humboldt County, by the way. There's been a, a flat line, no new cases for I think four or five days in a row, which is terrific. Um, but that's not the case uh, elsewhere in the region. And when you open everything back up, people start moving around again. And that's the other part of this. Uh, as much as uh, you might think you're behind the Redwood Curtain and, and uh, not subject to the same uh, conditions as the Bay Area, for example, uh, people are going to start moving around a lot more if we just reopen things. And we want to be careful to knock down that curve uh, throughout California, ideally throughout the country, uh, before we do too much relaxing. But Dr. Frankovich, please, uh, to fill in anything I, I left out. 
Well, you know, I, I agree. I think um, it, it's a really good question. And we recognize the cost societally of having things as restricted as they are right now on all kinds of levels, um, including sort of just general health equity issues. But I think that it's important to realize that while we're eager to be able to kind of move forward and ease some restrictions in light of these um, these recent negative um, tests and, and some decrease in general in, in many areas of the state, that the virus hasn't disappeared. We've just made it harder to transmit it um, by having people at home. And so really any move to ease the shelter in place has to be done with a lot of solid and informed planning um, with the recognition as, as you alluded to that what one area of the state does has an impact on other areas because of issues like travel. And so um, I can tell you that there is a lot of talk and planning right now about what preconditions would need to be met in order for us to um, be able to do that kind of move forward. Um, and then what would be the indicators that would cause us to have to back, uh, yeah. you know, move backwards again. And so it's, it's really um, an important discussion that's ongoing. I want to reassure people that there is a lot of planning on this at the moment and, and thought about how we can do this. And again, I would want to point out that we know the incubation period of this virus is about 14, can be up to 14 days or so. So seven days is great, um, but it's important that we're watching this going right. forward. And meanwhile, doing all of those preparedness pieces um, that at the outset, we had no idea how long we'd have to put in place. And we've been really working hard on but it does give us the opportunity to ensure we have things like adequate PPE everywhere, um, you know, adequate capacity built up locally so that if things do ease and we're seeing an increase in cases, we'll be well prepared to manage that. Well, and doctor, we should probably speak to the notion that we simply one day flip a switch and reopen the economy uh, because I think it's important to manage expectations uh, from, Absolutely. from my discussion uh, at the national level and with our local public health leaders, um, it won't look like that. It will be a gradual um, transition to something that's more like a semi-normal. Uh, did, did you, Doctor, want to discuss maybe a little bit about what that might look like? Well, I, I completely agree. I mean, this, you're absolutely right. It is not just a mere um, issue of do we just, you know, abandon shelter in place and move on. Um, we have to look at all kinds of features of this in terms of um, how, how can we gradually ease things to allow some mixing of people, of some you know, increase in activity in our community while um, still protecting those at highest risk of severe disease, those most vulnerable due to age or health conditions. And it's, it's clearly a balancing act, but you're right. The, the initial changes will be smaller and will be expanded as we see what happens once those are put in place. But again, we need to make sure that on the ground, everyone is ready to manage whatever, you know, those, those, those changes that occur as a result of our um, easing of any restrictions. Great. So let's go to the next question, Jenny. I want to try to get Layla and Greg into this conversation. Exactly. Perfect, you got a small bit. Okay, go perfect ahead. Perfect timing. So Great. North Coast News just asked okay. for a, a, a response from Layla and Greg on two questions about business. They want to know what would need to be in place in order for the businesses to reopen and for the economy to start, and what does the count? What do the county businesses need to be equipped in order to do this? And secondly. What can non-essential businesses do to survive the long-term closures and ha uh, with, with the SBDC running low on funding? Okay, Are two great solutions? questions. So um, we'll start with Layla and Greg. Uh, two questions I'm hearing. Uh, one is what, what do you think the business community needs uh, in order to get ready to have some normalcy restored, understanding it's likely to be gradual? Uh, and then what are the most uh, critical tools uh, to, to keep the lights on for the non-essential businesses that are still subject to this shelter-in-place uh, requirement. Thank you for your question. <laughs> so I, I'm going to weigh in first, and okay. I, I want to point out that this is a combined uh, uh, business recovery and public health question. 
what it's going to take for businesses to be able to reopen if they are not currently labeled as essential services has to do with whether or not we can ensure to whatever extent it's possible to that folks are getting tested when they need to get tested that there are rapid reagent tests as well and that um, all businesses once they reopen know how to practice um, whatever safety practices is going to are going to protect their employees and their customers. So I'm perfectly happy if Teresa wants to weigh in on that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I do want to point okay. out that as things change, and sometimes this is day by day, um, I really want to recommend that folks call the business services hotline that Humboldt County's Office of Emergency Services it has put out there. I'll look it up and I'll, I'll name it in a moment. Okay. Because awesome. if somebody is confused about how to operate safely, when to reopen, how to reopen, um, that is a good place to start. And then on the second question, I'm, I'm happy to punt this back and forth with Greg, but my recommendation is anticipate that once you are ready to, mm -hmm. to reopen, Please, I want you to be ready from the get-go. I want you to have laid out your plans for everything that you're going to do. Whatever deep clean you want to do, schedule it now, plan for it now. Whatever employees or contractors you need to have in place, tap them. Make sure you've got a plan for rapid turnaround. And if you need funding, well, let's talk about the funding. Um, the, the SBA lending program has been really really tough mm -hmm. for folks to apply to get answers from i want to i want to acknowledge that openly yeah and it's our job as the small business development center to help you to navigate those loan processes and applications to run your numbers to figure out what your real financial situation is now but i also want to point out that this community is is coming together in a way that i find really extraordinary and really important, especially for a rural community that's had trouble tapping the capital that we need from federal and state levels. There are already emergency bridge loans available from a number of our local banks and credit unions, as well as our community development finance institutions. Um, the County of Del Norte has come up with a business stabilization loan fund. The uh, city of Arcata was the first with its own emergency bridge loan, and there's more coming very, very soon. So I, I just want to acknowledge that there are community members and community leaders and lenders right here who are stepping up to fill in the gap um, until folks can access their federal funding. Yeah. Greg. Thank oh, you. I, yeah, I will kick in just here for a minute. And that, that business uh, line at the uh, uh, County Office of Emergency Services is 268-2527. And if you call that number, uh, you can get uh, answers. That's the, uh, there's two numbers. There's a public number. That's the business line. Um, I'm gonna say that again, so Greg. It says 707 what? 268-2527. Thanks. So, uh, so you know, just to, to, to add to what Layla said a little bit, um, uh, you know, what, what, what you know what hurts us here of course is knowing not knowing quite honestly because that's a public health decision on when things will get back to normal and so um so everything she said about it about uh you know being prepared is great you just don't know when it's going to be and and that goes for us too i mean we're you know we had the same notice as everybody else and we literally had to scatter our operations we're in and you know we have four employees and we're all working out of our own homes yeah. Um, and at the same time, trying to to manage this crisis, what we did at Reed Deck and uh, is immediately start uh, looking at uh, the timelines. Um, we're we're primarily uh, lenders, and we started looking at the timelines and saying, well, you know, if it's going to be a number of weeks, uh, uh, you know, four to six to seven or however many weeks it's going to take to get the SBA loans in place. Um, some of these businesses are going to need capital right away because they just shut down. And so we put a business uh, loan program in place um, that we were initially just servicing our existing customers. And so we've, we've lent about $300,000 or so in the last right. week and a half uh, to our own customers. Um, but now we, what we've done is we were able to secure funds from the Humboldt Area Foundation, the Headwaters Fund. We're working with the city of Fortuna um, and then our own funds. Um, and we're going to open up that program in a day or two uh, to non, uh, you know, the people who aren't already our customers of Red Region Economic Development. And, and those loans will be $25,000 as a maximum 
um, with a six month deferral at two and a half percent interest. So they're, they're pretty low interest. Yeah. And, and the goal of that is to provide some operating capital. So while you're waiting for your larger SBA right. loans or loan guarantees uh, from through the, through the uh, PPP program, uh, then uh, you have some operating capital. Um, again, we don't have a lot and we're pretty small, so we're going to do the best we can to get, get that out in the next day or two. Well, we may we may get you fully subscribed just from the folks who are watching this I, broadcast. I so. um, yeah, I warned my staff this was going to be happening. But that's fantastic. Um, I mean, the, the, you gave the phone number. Any other contact information people need? Because this is, this is a lifeline. This is a bridge line. Right. We know that there are problems with the rollout of these SBA programs. And in, in uh, the North Coast, you have a lifeline here, some of you at least, and we want to make sure you know yeah. how to get it. Yeah, and so the city of Arcadia with Arcadia Economic Development Corporations is, is doing something uh, similar. Um, and again, it is, it's a lifeline. Um, and, and it keeps you, you know, keeps you afloat while you're waiting for, for bigger dollars. I, I would recommend a, 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 something else, which is uh, uh, enrolling with the North Coast Small Business Development Center, and, and they're online. You just can Google them and, and find them. Uh, because the, the financial planning as you move forward is going to be critical. And, and here's the issue. Um, you know, a lot of these companies may be, and small businesses may be carrying some debt anyway. Yeah. And so while, um, while they've, they, they've gone to a negative cash flow situation here, um, the, the, uh, the new help they're getting is primarily more debt. Um, and so it's going to be really important um, even, even though the debt may be reasonably priced, you may have a long time to pay. Um, you are still going to be carrying debt upon your existing debt yeah. as, as you go forward here. And that's, and that's really going to, you know, that's really going to be an issue that, that many businesses will want to deal with right. going forward. So, so that's a great point. Uh, so Layla, Layla and her colleagues at SBDC can help walk folks through the planning aspects of, uh, how to manage existing debt, whether to take on new debt. There are also some grants available, emergency um, response mm -hmm. grants uh, through the SBA. So uh, your point about getting that advice is, is critical. Appreciate right. that. Um, Jared, if I can weigh yeah, in Lara, very please. briefly, because I do consider us a lifeline. And um, I want to make sure that folks understand that the North Coast SBDC has taken the responsibility of being a center of information as well as business consulting. So I really want you to visit our website and I really want you to sign up for our regular updates because we are compiling absolutely anything that we can find that we consider credible and helpful. And we're pushing it out to people who are or are not our clients. So that website is northcoastsbdc.org. And what that means, of course, is, you know, we've got a core of about 20 business advisors who are spending dozens and dozens of hours a week face to face via Zoom um, with clients trying to walk them through everything that they're struggling with and we're staffing up. But um, we are responsible for keeping folks informed as well as as coached and supported. So please reach out to us because that is exactly what we're here for. And if you're applying for many of the local emergency bridge loans, they're going to expect you to have been working with an SBDC advisor to make sure that you are navigating this with the best help possible. Fantastic. So, thank you. Yeah, in fact, that is one of the requirements of our loan is that um, uh, that you are enrolled with the SBDC or, or in that process. And we really also want people to be applying for the FBA loans uh, and the PPP program um, so that uh, they don't really count upon us as a long term Funding right. and as you know, depending on how long this goes on, as people are getting their loan monies, we can be an eligible expense to pay us off. We can then relend that money to someone else because um, we do have a fixed pot of funds here, um, and we could blow through it relatively quickly. And we would like to help as many people as we can. I appreciate that, and thanks to you both, and thanks to the Humboldt Area Foundation for partnering with you on that. I'm sure we're going to have more questions. Uh, about these SBA resources. Uh, so why don't we keep going, Jenny? Sure. In the meantime, mm -hmm. Justo Moscaso is asking... Justo. Say again? That's Justo. <laughs> oh, okay. Justo, <laughs> I'm <ahead>. sorry. <laughs> Wants to know about the USPS. There are a lot of questions in here, Good. in fact. One, worried about the Postal Service. And I'm sorry for my mispronunciation. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justo, it's a great question, and I am hearing from constituents because... Um, 
some statements have been made by President Trump and others that um, uh, the, the uh, hardships that the U.S. Postal Service uh, is experiencing right now in this crisis um, may not find a lot of sympathy in the White House. Uh, I will tell you, I think there's still an awful lot of support and sympathy in the United States Congress, uh, and there's definitely a lot of support and, and uh, sympathy uh, among the American people and the people that I represent. We want to have a, a healthy, strong, and I would, I would argue revitalized U.S. Postal Service for generations to come. So I'm committed to making sure that financial support for the Postal Service uh, is something we include uh, in the next waves of legislation, and, and I promise you to do everything I can to make sure that happens. Next question. Okay. Um, a KSRO listener is asking, do you know any resources for senior citizens without internet access who would normally go to libraries or coffee shops that are closed? Wow, great question. Seniors that uh, don't have internet access. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, that, that one challenges me because social distancing kind of stands in the way of a lot of the things that I would advise you to pursue. Um, so maybe the best I can come up with on the fly uh, is to contact any of my district offices where, near where you may live if there's something that you need from us that we can help with. Uh, to find a trusted relative, uh, you don't want to have a lot of social contact, but if there is a trusted family member that you have been in contact with that can bring you information and maybe uh, run down some of these leads on their internet connection for you, that sounds like a practical way uh, to solve that problem. Okay, a question from Ryan. Are deaths from other causes, like other causes than flu-like symptoms dropping as we shelter in place or are some like suicides rising? Okay, well that's obviously a, a question for Dr. Frankovich. What trends are we seeing in, in the North Coast, doctor, in terms of other um, deaths and, and uh, suicides were mentioned, but I've also heard that the social distancing we've put in place has actually reduced the number of cold and flu cases we've seen in the healthcare system. You want to speak to these things? Well, um, sure. The, what I can tell you is that, you know, we've moved through, during this course of COVID, um, just with time, we have moved through the bulk of our flu season. And so um, while I think early on, we were seeing individuals tested for COVID who actually um, were positive for flu. And uh, so that has sort of faded. And as we all know, typically our cold and flu season is winter. And as we move into spring, we expect to see fewer respiratory illnesses overall. Um, with COVID, um, my, my suspicion is that when we begin to see an increase in respiratory infections locally, um, there's a much greater chance that COVID will be the culprit at that time um, compared to other viruses, but we'll have to do testing to really know that. Right now, we clearly are seeing decreased influenza-like illnesses in, in our emergency rooms, and we are definitely seeing some decrease in emergency room util utilization overall. Um, yeah. Partly because I think people are healthier at the moment right. um, in terms of those illnesses and partly because I think people are choosing um, to not go to the emergency room with more um, minor health issues. Um, and so that has decreased numbers. Of course, we still need people to go in if they have issues that are really of concern. Yeah. What about the mental health aspect? I mean, we are hearing about domestic violence issues with shelter in place and the questioner, I think, was concerned that there might be depression and uh, mental health challenges up to and including suicides. Are you seeing any data on that in, in Humboldt County? Yes, honestly, you know, I haven't seen any new numbers on, on those in terms of, you know, trend lines. Um, I think that obviously, you know, we share concerns about mental health issues in our community, particularly um, with the stress of this situation, in addition to the somewhat limited resources at times um, because of, of workforce and, and that type of thing. So it's an important piece for us to be watching over time. I just don't have recently updated data okay. to be able to convey to you right now. Yeah, we're only a few weeks into this, so that's understandable. Next question. Okay, another question from North Coast News. Are buses helping to spread the virus via passengers and what can be done about this? Okay, question is about public transit and is this a vector for 
uh, viral transmission and what can be done uh, about it. Um, I hate to keep uh, picking on you, Dr. Frankovich, but I think a lot of these questions keep coming into your wheelhouse. What, what do you think about public transit as a vector for spreading the virus? And before you answer, I mean, the second part of the question is what can be done about it? Uh, I, I will tell you what I think cannot be done about it, and that is to shut down public transit because uh, we have essential workers that depend on public transit to get around. They are hurt just as hard uh, and, and in some cases are asked to take great risks. So I think we should go the extra mile to make transit safe and to protect them. Uh, but we've got to keep providing uh, what for many people um, uh, is, is simply a lifeline to help them uh, pay the bills. Yes, uh, you know, certainly it's, that was the intent of the shelter in place order was to really focus on um, the, the continuation of public transit for essential workers so that they are able to, to provide those services. And I think the measures on, for instance, buses in, are, are the recommendations that we're seeing kind of diffusely, which are, you know, social distancing with seating, um, with lower uh, total passenger loads, with ventilation, with signage about behavior, with um, you know all of that messaging about the transportation is not recreational, it is for essential work. Um, obviously, we've discussed um, air travel as well um, mm -hmm. in the course of all of this. And again, that messaging has been clear that you know recreational air travel, it, this is not the time for that. Um, but what we recognize is that air travel allows, for instance, some of our very critical workers um, to come in and out of the area. And, and so it, it's, you know, it is, again, something that we cannot discontinue. But we do have signage um, at the airport, for example, about uh, what is expected of people returning from travel. Any, any thoughts about uh, surfaces? I mean, we, we've talked about masks. We've talked about distancing. I know folks are uh, also worried about, you know, can they, uh, if they have to uh, get back and forth to work on public transit, can they sit in one of the seats on a bus without worrying that they're going to somehow uh, be exposed to, the, exposed to the virus that way? Well, it, it's a good point. And, you know, one of the other things um, is that issue about, you know, asking on transit that there is frequent cleaning um, so that surfaces that are commonly touched are, um, are cleaned. Um, we're also asking individuals, of course, to increase their frequency of hand washing or use of hand sanitizer to help protect themselves. The fact that we're asking people to mask um, is another effort to help decrease the amount of virus that might be present in, in those kinds of environments, as well as, again, you know, the point about ventilation and, um, and distancing on those vehicles. So okay. all of those things taken together can help to reduce risk for what is, in fact, a necessary service. Thank you. Okay, Lynn Glenn asks a question for the current town hall meeting. There, in Humboldt County, there have been few or no, or no additional cases of COVID in the last week. Is that because there are fewer tests being completed? How many tests have been completed each day this week compared to earlier weeks? Okay, uh, doctor, do you wanna give the, the trend line on testing capacity in recent weeks in Humboldt? I don't know if we lost Dr. Frankovich, but- uh, Here, I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. I'm having difficulty getting the new doc here. Um, so it, um, I was saying that in general, we've had, um, we've sort of put out our testing capacity as about 55 per day. Um, and that was an increase from when we very first started, um, which was I think early March, where we were at about 20 per day. Um, we, um, are, we believe our max, as we're currently outfitted, would be about um, 60 on most days. And part of that is simply because of the process of how we have to extract the samples, be able to yeah. set them up with the machine, do all of that, to, and then run the testing in batches. So um, what I can tell you is that uh, we have seen some decrease in the amount of testing done, just I would say in the last week or so, perhaps. Although I think we reported, I think we had done 45 um, in this last reporting period, the last day or so. But I think that part of that is because in general, the, the emergency rooms, the physicians are seeing less respiratory illness that is confusing um, yeah. with the diagnosis of COVID. And so there's been perhaps less of that indicator. Um, because of that decrease, 
We are looking at other ways that we can utilize the testing, the little unexpected increase in our testing capacity in terms of some surveillance. So that's what we're working on internally to, to use this little um, slow period to be able to do. But you don't think that the, the fact that Humboldt has had several days in a row of no new uh, cases, that that's not because you're doing less testing, I think is what the no, question was No, it's at. not because we've restricted yeah. testing further or made it more difficult to okay. access that testing. Um, I think it probably relates in part to, um, as I said, to just the sort of decreased number of people presenting with the symptoms um, that would um, make their physician inclined to um, test. Okay, thanks. Next question. Okay, well, all, Sarah wants to know, will all states be able to vote by mail in November oh, 2020? Oh, great. Sarah, I'm so glad you asked this question. She's asking about a national vote by mail um, program. Uh, and I, I mentioned several things that Congress has to do. We've got to provide more funding for a number of priorities. Uh, we've got to make sure that the long-term economic revival, including infrastructure, uh, is adequate. Uh, but we also have to anticipate that this public health emergency uh, may still be with us or might come back to us uh, next fall. And we have to protect the national election. We've got to make sure the election is secure. And we've got to make sure that something like what we saw recently in Wisconsin never, ever happens again. And what I'm talking about there uh, is because uh, there was a lack of uh, planning ahead. Uh, this shelter-in-place uh, requirement was imposed, and uh, they moved ahead with an election under the same old rules, which forced people to make a terrible choice. Do you exercise your constitutional right to vote and put your own health and others' health at risk? Or do you stay home and not vote, putting our democracy at risk? That, that's just a choice we should never ask anyone to face. And so I am pushing very hard to make sure that we have contingency plans in place for the November election, that we include uh, adequate financial support for states to move to all mail balloting, which works. Uh, we have entire states like Oregon that do it. Uh, and you actually don't see uh, fraud. And in fact, uh, the indications are you see less fraud. And one of the reasons it's more secure and more reliable is that there's a paper trail. That absentee ballot can absolutely be traced to every single voter. So it makes sense from an election integrity perspective and certainly from a public health and, and planning perspective to get moving. And we're going to have to do that right away because plans for moving states to an entirely all-male balloting uh, program need to begin very soon. So I, I completely agree with the question and we'll be pressing very hard to make sure we provide that support in one of the next uh, pieces of legislation that we pass. All right, there's another political question here for you. Okay. Jimmy T wants to know why you don't do your job and support my president instead of impeding his every effort to better America. Stop Gavin Newsom from turning California into a socialist state we want to work and support ourselves, not depend on the government. No more divide and conquer. All right. Well, Jimmy, we probably don't have uh, the same politics, uh, I'm judging from your question. But um, I also have a very different understanding of what my job is. Uh, I, would, I would push back respectfully on the notion that my job is to simply support the president. Uh, I would love to support the president where he's doing the right thing. Uh, and even in this public health emergency, I would have been very supportive of the president using the Defense Production Act, for example, to make sure that we are producing the medical supplies and the testing capacity that we desperately need. He would have gotten high praise for me had he done the right thing, and he hasn't done it. So um, I think my oath is to the Constitution and to the people I represent and looking out for their welfare. Their welfare. That requires me sometimes to criticize and even oppose this president. Uh, and I will be doing that um, consistent with my own oath and my own conscience. Um, the second part of that question, though, was, uh, Jenny, refresh me on that last question. There was, a, there was two parts. Um, stop Gavin Newsom from turning Oh, socialism. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, what's really interesting to me about this crisis is that it's sort of brought out everyone's inner socialist. Um, there's different uh, priorities that come to mind. And some uh, very conservative Republicans are looking for massive handouts from the federal government for their favorite industry or for their uh, favorite special interest. 
Um, there's even one Republican, very conservative Republican senator from Missouri, who it's been written about lately, is calling for basically um, so something like uh, a, a, a government takeover of payroll for all businesses in the United States. Now, in any normal situation, that sounds an awful lot like socialism. In fact, it, it's sort of more than socialism. Uh, but in this crisis, I think we've just got to throw these labels away and think about what are the tools that our government can bring to bear to help get us through. I don't think we're in any danger of the United States turning into an actual socialist country. But if there are some things that can be done uh, with our public funds, with our public agencies that save lives, that keep our businesses open, that help families and workers through a real tough patch, I'm all for it and I'm not going to worry too much about the labels. Next okay. question. John Harper and a number of others are frustrated about the slowness of the money coming through PPP and EIDL, EIDL loans. Right. So the Congressman, I've had an application with EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, for three weeks, almost two, I've had with three for almost two weeks, and my bank stopped processing PPP. What's the plan? Well, Greg, this kind of gets to the point that you were raising, and I will turn back to, uh, to Greg and Leela on this question, but uh, it, it is going to take some time for that SBA money to come through, and apparently it's taking some time to even process applications. So um, obviously the bridge loans that uh, some of our local neighbors may be uh, able to access would be one solution, but what else, Greg and Leila, do you, do you think needs to be said about this? Well, um, you know, there's, there's, there's was some, I think, confusion about BPP when it was announced. Um, you know, it was announced that the $350 billion were set aside uh, for the PPP program. And, and, and really what that was was loan guarantees. And, and so that meant you had to go to your, your financial institutions to apply. And not all financial institutions were um, actual SBA right. were called preferred lenders, so they couldn't even participate. And that included a couple of the larger institutions here locally. And, um, and of course, it hit those organizations very hard as well. So that was announced uh, on Friday, uh, April 3rd, um, that the, you, know, the, you could get these applications. And uh, in fact, the banks, uh, there wasn't a, a whole lot of uh, direction to the banks and the credit unions about how to do that. And they weren't even staffed up uh, for this huge onrush. And so, uh, you know, I cut them some slack. I do know that some of our local uh, banks and, and credit unions, the smaller ones, you know, brought in people to work all weekend. They've been working at nights trying to process this absolute deluge of applications. And in fact, the capital is on the backside for those PPP programs. All, the banks only really access capital at the time of the guarantee. So, um, so they, you know, they had to manage their own capital as well. Hey, Greg, um, can I stop you there? Uh, yeah. Just to, to fill in a little bit of that and maybe a, a little bit of a colloquy. On that, so so what you're pointing out is that there are some resources, grants, and and some types of loans that flow directly from the SBA. But for the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, it was decided to go through lenders, and Correct. that generally means uh, banks and and credit unions. This is a huge conversation we're having right now in Washington, as we talk about uh, augmenting and and um, backfilling this program because I think we understand it's not working very well. And part of it is because the big banks were able to kind of quickly jump in, but a lot of the smaller community lenders uh, find it hard. They lack the capacity and they haven't had the same support. So we're really working on trying to make sure the next wave of legislation brings a lot more community-based lenders into the mix. Right. I just right. wanted to add that. And, and we're also working every day to try to bring new smaller banks and credit unions into the mix. We've been able, uh, my office has been able to help get approvals for just recently Redwood Coast Credit Union uh, and uh, Redwood Capital Bank, and, and we got more that we're working on online. So back to you, but I wanted to just uh, fill in a couple of those details. 
Well, that was it. Yeah. You know, so you, you mentioned Coast Central Credit Union, and yeah. they, they uh, were applying uh, because they weren't eligible to participate in the PPP program. And of course, they're a big institution up here. And um, and but they did get uh, they did get a, approved last last week. So that so that's great. So you know those those institutions are really powering through it. So what we tried to do at Redec, and again, we're expanding this program uh, very soon because you know we're literally a four person shop, all working out of our homes right now. Um, and so we do want to have the, those short-term loans. And again, Arcata Economic Development Corporation is doing the same thing. They're based in Eureka as well. Um, and we both cover, uh, you know, I cover all of Humboldt County through REDEC, and then they cover six counties. Uh, and a goal, again, in the city of Arcata did this, the goal is that short-term funding to, to help keep yeah. you alive while you're going through the SBA process. And, and the, this question is specific to the delay in, in getting uh, these resources <clears throat> available. Um, I'm, I'm certainly hearing a lot about that, um, and I'll invite Layla uh, to speak to, you know, what advice she wants to share with small businesses who are confronting that delay. But I, I do want to share at least a little good news along with all of the frustrations. Uh, there are several Humboldt County small businesses that have actually gotten their money, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the North Coast Journal uh, is a good example of that. There's a handful of others we've heard about just in the last few days. So some of this money is finally starting to flow. Uh, Layla, I'll let you jump in on the issue of managing the delay. Yeah, thank you, Jared. So I, I think the direct answer to John's question, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that he posed it because he's not alone, is mm -hmm. you're not alone. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of economic injury disaster loan applications, that's the loan uh, money coming directly from the Small Business Administration to businesses, um, are still holding on, waiting to get their answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a couple of, of bits of information that I'm trying to get out there and make sure that people understand. Oh. Oh, we, gosh. Are you, you still there, Layla? Lady. <laughs> Gosh, she, she had set that up so well. There were really... Wow, cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah. We're going to come back to Layla as soon as her internet connection is restored because she was going to advise us on um, some, some critical considerations for uh, folks managing the delay. But her initial response really brought out an important point. We, we've got to keep these different SBA tools distinct from each other. And even I was sharing the good news of some folks that have gotten Paycheck Protection Program loans, uh, those uh, are separate from the direct disaster loans that you get with the SBA. So each of these right. tools is just slightly different, uh, and folks like Layla and Greg can help you kind of navigate the differences and figure out what works best for you and how to best utilize them. Jenny, you want to tee up the next question? Yeah, I've got a couple more here. So Mark Saylors and others are um, having problems with Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo told them to wait until the 10th to apply, and they're suspicious that means the money won't be there. What's going on with Wells Fargo? Yeah, Mark, Mark uh, and I have uh, spoken on Facebook about his challenge, and, and many others are in the same boat. Wells Fargo, if I could be very blunt, has been jerking a lot of people around. Uh, they initially ran into a cap on their lending uh, capacity. Now, that cap is because they got into all kinds of legal trouble by jerking consumers around for years before this. Uh, but the Federal Reserve uh, granted them a waiver of that cap. There is no reason they cannot continue to enroll folks in the Paycheck Protection Program if they want to. And let me just emphasize that all of this money is federally guaranteed. So at the end of the day, uh, there's no excuse for a big bank like Wells Fargo or any other big bank saying that uh, we're capped out or we don't have capacity or we've got to start having these arbitrary restrictions on who can get this and how much they can get. This is federal money passing through the banks to you. Uh, that's what Congress intended. And uh, I am happy to uh, join with my colleagues. We're doing this right now uh, to push back on the big banks that really aren't, aren't playing uh, fairly when it comes to administering this program. Greg, did you want to add anything to that? Or if, if I got any of that wrong, please uh, feel free to correct me. No, I, I would. I would, no. I think that's that's right. And and you know, I think the, one of the points is, is is we are now what for you know in our fourth week of this, we're building the airplane while we're flying it. And so um, you know, uh, I think through all the best intentions, the SBA and others rushed out to try to get something on the ground. And the practical reality is that there, there's a number of us here right on the ground working directly with businesses. 
who uh, you know who had some questions about how things worked and 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 different things were changing. Um, you know, in a normal situation where we had a disaster, um, someone like us or SBDC, you know, we would be in our offices, we'd have you know <laughs> everything set, and 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 uh, would not be necessarily affected by the disaster. And I think that goes true. But this is a a 50 state, you know, every county, every city, every town disaster. And so we're trying to uh, trying to build the aircraft while we fly it. And um, so I understand the frustration. Yeah. I think that um, that it is, you know, every week that we've been working on this, every day we've been working on this, I think we've been seeing improvements in the process that he's getting in place. Um, but it's hard, you know, um, we literally, you know, again, I mentioned it earlier, our organization is four people and we're, work, we're working in four different yeah. locations right now trying to, to respond to this crisis. Well, so some, um, of the, some of the um, feelings of being overwhelmed, I can understand it's small banks and lenders that are trying to come right. up to speed. Um, and it is a huge amount of money that's being stood up really quickly, but I'm less sympathetic to the big institutions. Uh, where frankly we, we are running into a lot of our problems. They have the capacity to get this right. right. And we have to distinguish between the inherent uh, challenges of rolling out a new program and folks who may be gaming the system. And I'm right. worried about the latter category because uh, literally from the very first, I, I started hearing about one big bank that was only making this available to its existing business lending customers. Now, right. you, can, you can understand why that sounds a lot like they were shoring up their own lending portfolio instead of doing what Congress intended, which was to push this money out to the people who needed it most. We continue to hear anecdotal accounts of big banks actually um, soliciting some of their big business customers and pushing these programs on them, even if they don't need them. That's right. not what Congress intended either. So um, certainly in the next rounds of legislation that you see out of Congress, I'm going to be pushed and I hope we're able to deliver some reforms and fixes to prevent the abuse and the gaming of the system while we try to find new partners out there at the community level to push this money out faster and better to people who need it. Greg, I'll give you a, a last word on this and then we'll go on to the next question if you have anything to add. Well, Actually, I, I think we'll that's the last word if you don't Oh, Layla's mind. back. Go okay. ahead, go ahead, Layla. Right. Layla's yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I want to reinforce that um, the politic answer is we really appreciate the way the lenders who partner with us have been responsive to us and our clients. And I know folks have been working 24 7 and through the weekend to get these paycheck loan uh, applications processed. That said, um, I personally want to thank you and offer appreciation for any legislation that shores up and supports a, a strong infrastructure of, of local banking, local credit unions, locally controlled decision making. I think that that's healthy for this rural community in particular now and for the long term amen. in an emergency or not. So thank you for that, Jared. Well, amen. And well, we, we lost well, your I'll connection earlier. Yeah. Did, did you want to finish the thought that you were cut off on earlier? Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, good point. Good. So um, economic injury disaster loan applications, if you have not put yourself in the, uh, in the queue, you know, even if you don't know whether you're going to want to accept this money, get yourself in the queue anyway, because you might find later that you accept it, you might find later that you don't, no harm, no file either way. And it really is now a much simplified application. So if you visit covid19relief.sba.gov, there's the application right there. Yeah. It's kind of a pain in the neck, but it is absolutely worth it. The second thing I want folks to know is there's been a lot of kerfuffle around the um, element of the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, touching on the $10,000 up to $10,000 advance. So I know some business owners who are watching and listening know what I'm talking about. They want that $10,000 advance, they want it within three days, and now they're finding out that it is up to $1,000 per employee, including the owner, not a flat 10,000, be clear about that because mm -hmm. that's new information that's and the second is it's not coming in two or three days it's coming in more like weeks mm -hmm. so that is the reality the second thing that we've been hearing from folks uh, is uh, you know some people got an email 
from the Small Business Administration saying, listen, I'm so sorry, but your, your loan total is not going to, you know, automatically come up to your six months of operating expenses. We're trying to spread the wealth, and so you're only going to get a max of $15,000 in addition to that up to $10,000 advance. That's actually uh, an erroneous email. So if you got mm -hmm. that, this is this is hot off the presses directly from our SBA contact this afternoon, which you know made everybody's eyebrows rise. Yeah. That is apparently not the case. Um, the SBA wow. is not saying that folks are going to be capped at fifteen thousand. They're saying continue to apply for everything that you need. And um, and then finally, the last thing I'll say is if you did apply for this loan program on or before March 29th, I want you to go back and I want you to do it again yeah. because that's going to get you into the upgraded system, which will make sure that you have a, um, a confirmation number that begins with the number three and hopefully, hopefully reduces your wait time. Wow. But again, John, you are absolutely right. Everybody is in a holding pattern. That said, Everybody's in a holding pattern, and yet the SBA has been able to approve and start pushing out $160 billion yeah. worth already as of this morning. So they're humming along, yeah. um, but we're all worried and frustrated. And I tell you, looking at our, our the intake queue for SBDC Business Advising Services reads to me like a phone book. It looks like the yellow pages. It is really scary, yeah. and we just got to be clear about that. And I want to make a point about that letter and, and, you know, I, <laughs> I texted uh, the Layla over the weekend cause we're all working seven days a week now. And, and that letter came out about the 15,000. I said, what is this? And uh, we went back and forth and, and I think then went and opened up another bottle of wine at our respective houses. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I, to everybody who, who, you know, there's with social media, there's obviously a, a dark side of, of a lot of false information out there, both health related and, and, and even, you know, around the business. And, and I would say go to the official sources. And, and for us uh, in Humboldt County, certainly that's the North Coast SBDC. We started a, a group that started doing Zoom calls even before the shelter in place order. Um, where we coordinate uh, three days a week now, we coordinate all the, there's usually about 30, 35 people on the call, and we're coordinating all of our information and response, and we're checking in regularly. And one of the things we decided was to try to funnel as much of our information as we could into that North Coast SBDC website so that it's accurate um, and, and it's sort of the clearinghouse for Humboldt County, certainly, and Del Norte. Uh, Humboldt County and Del Norte uh, business information, and that includes accurate information on what what's actually happening with the SBDC, or excuse me, SBA programs. Um, so you know, keep checking that. You know, a lot of us have just taken our web pages individually and pointed it towards that page, um, and uh, you know, put a lot of burden on on Layla and her staff. But I think it was great to have a single source that we could rely on in the region. Uh, both as uh, service providers, but certainly as businesses as well. All right, uh, some so great think, points, yeah. some some really good points. And, and Layla, yours was a very timely point because we're hearing from people who've gotten that uh, letter. Oh, it looks uh, like they muted you, Congressman. They muted me, but I am I unmuted? <laughs> Sorry, Jared, you're done. You don't get to speak anymore. Somebody <laughs> muted me. Oh, I have so many it's constituents that wish they had that now. button, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Much better. Much all better. right. Uh, Jenny, how many more questions okay, can we so, take? Congressman, you've, you've extended this by another 15 minutes. We're way you. over the one Do hour. You? I hope it's, uh, I find this incredibly valuable. Uh, our panelists have stuck with us for some extra time, but let's take one more question. At perfect. Least. Perfect. So, yeah. Perfect. And we, we appreciate you doing that with the technical difficulties. So Kirk uh, is asking, Kirk is commenting and it's a, it, it kind of begs okay. your response. Testing, tracing, and treatment using the Defense Production Act is essential for moving toward our new normal, which begins with testing essential workers. Hopefully, Gavin Newsom will lead us out of the shelter-in-place ASAP and set examples for all states if the federal government continues to avoid leading our nation out of this pandemic crisis. Can you comment? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I really think testing and protection are kind of the two uh, urgent priorities right now. And, and it's because all of us want to get through this as quickly as possible, but we also want to get through it in a way where it doesn't just come back to us a few months from now, which would be even worse uh, than continuing for a few more weeks with the hardships of shelter in place. So these are tough, tough decisions. Um, I place my faith in the public health professionals who will tell us 
uh, when it is time to safely begin transitioning to a gradual semi-normal state. Uh, we're nowhere close to having the kind of ubiquitous rapid testing that we need, I think, to feel comfortable going there yet. Uh, but uh, I take Gavin Newsom at his word that he is owning this testing challenge, that he's going to deliver uh, huge new resources by the end of this month, and that's, that's great news. Uh, we've got to keep working on the protection side as well. I'll just share with you that today uh, I had a, a very positive experience because I was able to work with a actually a Humboldt County manufacturer, I won't mention who, but uh, a company that wants to repurpose and has begun repurposing through its Canadian affiliate uh, their manufacturing capacity to make medical gowns, which are in short supply. Canada uh, quickly approved that and it's working. Thousands and thousands of medical gowns are being made. But here in the U.S., they can't get their phone calls returned. And I was able to jump in and make some calls to connections at FEMA and FDA and it looks like we may be on a, on a fast track to getting that approval in place. So it's, it's gratifying uh, when you can do that, but it's also frustrating that we still don't have a national strategy and a top-down, well-led effort to provide all of these essential supplies so that we can protect medical workers and first responders and others. We're going to need to get that ironed out uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, I think uh, with that, we will bring this town hall to an end. Thanks to everyone who joined me on the various mediums. Thanks to our fantastic Humboldt County panelists, to uh, Dr. Frankovich, to Leela and Greg for your expertise. Uh, I hope everyone will tune in to our weekly office hours Wednesday at noon on my uh, Rep Huffman Facebook page. And uh, this broadcast will be posted in its entirety on my website, uh, along with lots of other important resources for you uh, related to the COVID-19 crisis, you just simply have to go to huffman.house.gov. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll see you soon.